Good afternoon. This is the afternoon meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on May 11th. We are gathered here to uh, review S3. Um, I hope, so my apologies for calling you all away from caucus meetings. I hope you are comfortable with that. Um, it's just, we've, we've got to keep moving to get uh, this bill done, which ties into the budget, which ties into our adjournment. So I hope you are okay with calling this meeting. And thank you everybody for shifting. I think Representative Lalonde, you are here to walk us through the bill. And um, we have a few other people joining us. One of the questions committee that we need to attend to is, is that there are costs associated with this, but um, no money was appropriated for it. And we need to figure out if we, um, what the costs are and how to manage those uh, going forward. And um, if our guests have any advice to us, both on the part of the Department of Mental Health. I think they may have some thoughts on their side. And I know we have, don't have representatives from the um, Vermont um, Legal Aid, but there is a cost there that we need to think about. Um, so we need to sort that. Rep Lalonde, if you will give us the broad overview, help us understand generally what the bill is doing and then bring us down to the particulars over which we have jurisdiction, obviously the money pieces. So thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely, thank you uh, for having me. So the bill uh, addresses various, a uh, couple things. It addresses proceedings, court proceedings that occur uh, in criminal cases when there's an issue concerning either the defendant's sanity at the time of the offense uh, or the defendant's competency to stand trial for the offense. Uh, and, and it deals with a number of pr uh, procedures uh, that are in law. And I'm not going to go over the first two sections that uh, address a couple procedures because they have no money attached to them. So I'm going to jump right to the third pr uh, proceeding. Uh, uh, and that has to do uh, with, actually, I'm sorry, the second, it's the second section, I apologize. Uh, that has to do when uh, a court finds an individual to uh, have uh, been insane at the time of the offense, or that the individual's not competent to stand trial, there has to be a commitment hearing. Uh, you're no longer in a, uh, uh, a criminal case, you're in a different kind of proceeding called a commitment hearing. And the question is whether the individual is a danger to self or others. Uh, if the court finds that the individual is a danger to self or others, uh, the person is committed to the Department of Mental Health uh, or to Dale if it's a, a developmental uh, issue that underlies uh, the finding of incompetency or uh, insanity. Uh, currently, uh, when you, uh, for a commitment hearing, Defender General's, uh, the, the attorney from the Defender General's office, uh, who was defending the case uh, when it was called a criminal case, uh, may continue uh, in defending the case when it goes to a commitment hearing. But the individual, the defendant, is at somewhat of a disadvantage in that case because the Defender General attorneys yeah. are not experts yeah. in commitment hearings, which yeah. is a different kind of a hearing. Uh, Whereas attorneys from the Vermont Legal Aid are experts in this kind of uh, hearing. So what the bill does in section two uh, is it allows, and let me find it. So I'm, it allows an individual to, to be entitled to have the counsel appointed from Vermont Legal Aid to represent the person in the commitment hearing. Uh, the other change is that uh, because the individual is going to be committed to the Department of Mental Health or to Dale, uh, that they are now explicitly allowed uh, to appear and call witnesses uh, at that proceeding. Uh, and that's really where the money comes from. 
in the fiscal note, but I'm going to jump ahead real quick before we just back up to that, because there is one other monetary component to this. Uh, there is uh, in section six, uh, creation of a forensic working group uh, that at a very high level is looking at various uh, uh, intersections and proceedings when uh, mental health uh, is an issue in the criminal uh, justice system. Uh, and there's a number of uh, reports, uh, consecutive reports that are, are to be produced. Uh, and there is an a, 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 a ask of $25,000, appropriation of $25,000 in that section for uh, an expert to assist uh, in the uh, consultant uh, to assist with the work of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, my understanding is that because the stakeholders in the work group uh, have different slices of knowledge and interests, but no real expertise in the issues they're looking at, uh, the, actually the health committee, which really took the lead on this part of the bill, uh, asked the Department of Mental Health for an estimate for the cost of a consult consultant, and that's where the $25,000 comes from. Uh, so the cost for the stipends for the work group members was left for appropriations to fill in. They are not included in the $25,000. I'm glad I just read this note from Representative uh, from Northfield, uh, which to explain that component of it. So, so you probably have questions on that part as well. And I may have to phone a friend, that being Representative Donahue, depending on what your questions are on that particular part of the bill. Uh, but backing up uh, on the section two, uh, we do have the uh, fiscal note uh, that looks at additional resources for Vermont legal aid uh, from 245000 to $265,000. I can give a brief explanation of that, uh, which I will do right now before I get on to the other couple points. So the, a question that we've asked uh, of Vermont legal aid and the Defender General's office is, well, you know, are we going to have more commitment hearings? Is that why there's all of a sudden additional cost? Well, no, the answer is what we're changing here should not change the number of commitment hearings that we are seeing. Uh, so my question is, well, are we gonna offset the cost by a decrease uh, in what the Defender General's office uh, would need? Uh, and the answer to that was you can't really eliminate any FTEs in the Defender General's office because this work is spread throughout the state uh, through all of the various attorneys and it, they, it only makes up a small part of the work of the Defender General's office. So it would really be hard to, to find, you know, to be able to reduce small portions of FTEs throughout the state. So, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to increase from what I understand from Vermont Legal Aid unfortunate that they're not here today, but that uh, they will need some additional resources on their end. So that's, that's where that amount comes from. Um, the other two components, as I understand it, the independent evaluations and the legal representation for the Department of Mental Health uh, is specifically related to the fact that the Department of Mental Health can now appear and call witnesses in the proceeding. And if you have additional uh, questions on that, we do have uh, Morning Fox uh, is a witness here today and, and can certainly ask, uh, you know, go in depth a little bit further on, on their needs uh, for, for that component. I think that's all I have. And, and I'm wondering, I could ask uh, Eric Fitzpatrick, he's the uh, legislative counsel on this, if I missed anything or if he has anything to add. Hi, good afternoon, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council. And other than introducing myself, I have nothing else to add. So <laughs> Representative Levine, you covered it perfectly. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. You bet. Thank you. Um, perhaps we should um, and move to um, Mr. Langweil and ask him to walk us through the fiscal note and that may help us understand this. Okay, great, uh, for the record, Noel Langweil, the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, I think Representative Lalonde's uh, already started it off, but um, I can just try to fill in the blanks. 
Um, so it was referring to section B, which in, um, and essentially it's estimated that uh, Vermont Legal Aid would need between 245 and 265,000 in funding for additional staff and resources to represent these clients. Um, and then additionally, um, according to the Departmental Health, uh, they would need between 120 and 150 uh, for the independent psychiatric examinations and between 95 and 155,000 for, provi uh, for providing legal representation to the department in these commitment um, proceedings. So uh, between those two, it's estimated that it would be between 460 and $570,000 would be needed. Um, if I recall, the bill as it initially passed Senate Judiciary had $500,000 in the bill. And then when it went to Senate Appropriations, it was pulled out. Um, and then also section six, there's another $25,000 uh, that's appropriate. I think Representative Lalonde, um, hopefully I said your name correctly, um, uh, articulated the need from that, uh, um, already articulated the need for that. Um, Representative Yacovani. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, um, I can. Yeah, can. Thank you. Can someone explain to me again? I may have missed it. How was this service paid for last year? How has it been paid for in the past? This can't be the first time we've done independent evaluations and this type of representation. Can anyone help me? Thank you. So let, let me jump in and, uh, and I think actually I'm gonna yield to Morning Fox on that. Uh, I know that uh, for the representation on the Vermont Legal Aid, as I mentioned before, Defender Generals would have covered that for the most part, although in some instances, Vermont Legal Aid did uh, provide or does provide uh, representation, uh, but this is going to increase the amount of representation that they're gonna have to provide. Uh, but on the other two components, I will uh, defer to Morning uh, Fox. Thank you, Representative uh, Lalonde. Uh, for the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, it might be easiest if I just kind of explain the process a little bit of how it's operated in the past uh, and is currently operating. And one of the issues is that when these proceedings happen through the criminal court division, uh, the Department of Mental Health does not have any standing. And so we're not a part of any of the, the hearings. Uh, Vermont Legal Aid is also not a part of those hearings. Uh, as Representative Lalon mentioned, it's the Defender General um, that would be representing uh, the, the defendees, uh, as well as uh, the, generally the state's attorneys, occasionally attorney generals, but generally state's attorneys that would be prosecuting the case. Uh, once there's been a determination that the person is uh, either incompetent to stand trial or is being adjudicated as not guilty by reason of insanity, they go to a commitment hearing. Um, and even at that point, Vermont Legal Aid and, and Department of Mental Health are not uh, parties to those, to those uh, hearings. Uh, and so the states, it was the, the funds that paid for attorney time were attorney general, state's attorney, and defender generals. Uh, and so what, we're, what, what this legislation is envisioning is that uh, at that time, at that commitment hearing, that uh, instead of the defender general representing the defendees, that the defendees would have the option of, of being represented by Vermont Legal Aid and their expertise in mental health law uh, to represent them. Uh, and that the department, we would not have party status per se, but it would give us the ability to, to appear in court to ask questions and cross-examine witnesses, which we have not had the ability in the past. And so the increase for, for Vermont Legal Aid is to take over these new cases at, at this point in time. Uh, and so that's, that's their increased caseload. Uh, for the department, we're not necessarily having party status and taking over these cases. Uh, but will be involved more. And so that's the ask for the, for the DMH uh, portion of funds, the 95 to 155,000 uh, for our attorney generals 
to uh, have an increased caseload of work uh, that will need to be covered in these hearings. Uh, there is the possibility that there could be uh, a conflict. The attorney general's office is uh, prosecuting the case uh, that our attorney generals at DMH uh, may not be able to actually represent the department uh, due to a conflict. And so this money would also help cover uh, conflict counsel uh, that the department might need uh, to be able to appear uh, in any of these hearings. Uh, and in relation to the independent evaluation, that is uh, really directed towards legal aid and with their participation, uh, it is not uncommon for them to seek independent evaluations um, at that point, uh, if they're going to contest the need for hospitalization or something of that sort. And so this money uh, would be to help pay for the independent evaluations uh, that Vermont Legal Aid uh, may seek. May I follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, you may. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Morning Fox, appreciate it. Um, I'm still left with... Um, why the change? Why not just keep it the way it was? Were people displeased with the public defender? And I wish I was more uh, diplomatic to word it differently. Yeah. I don't mean to disparage anyone, but was there a um, lack of satisfaction with the way it was done? At I think some four hundred and fifty thousand dollars less a year. I think there's been a, a lot of conversations around uh, the appropriateness and being able to uh, ensure. Uh, the appropriate level of representation uh, to a traditionally underserved, uh, underheard uh, population, uh, one that traditionally has uh, little to no voice, uh, if you will. And so the idea of having uh, representation by Vermont Legal Aid, who are the experts in mental health law uh, from a defense perspective, to be able to represent people who are potentially being committed uh, either into an inpatient or an outpatient uh, commitment under uh, uh, to be committed under the care and custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health should have the most appropriate representation uh, available to them. Um, and so there's been questions from the advocate community as well as other conversations uh, which DMH supports that uh, these individuals should have the most appropriate representation possible. It may be in the numbers and I just haven't seen them, but how many such cases are there annually, approximately? We have several hundred uh, cases a year uh, where there's competency or sanity uh, being asked for. There's approximately uh, 60 individuals a year that actually are committed uh, on inpatient uh, evaluations. Uh, just to give you a sense, um, mm -hmm. but it's not insignificant. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Uh, before I go to Rep. Shy, I wondered if Representative Lalonde would care to <laughs> add to what um, Deputy Commissioner Fox just said. Obviously, the Judiciary <clears throat> Committee had an opinion as to why we needed to change the way the system is working today. Rep. Lalonde. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so, yeah, I, we, we agree uh, with uh, what uh, Morty Fox uh, explained. We did hear from a number of uh, individuals who supported the idea of having that expertise for the commitment hearing. It, it's a very different type of hearing than where uh, a, a criminal hearing where you're trying to determine guilt, uh, whether the individual is guilty of a crime, as opposed to uh, looking at the relatively convoluted or difficult uh, kind of hearing for determining whether an individual should be committed. Uh, so, so just having that level of expertise, having the involvement of, of the agency that uh, may, may take custody of the individual, that being the Department of Mental Health or, or Dale, uh, made a lot of sense for us to have a better outcome uh, for the individuals in these situations. Thank you. Uh, Representative Shai. There, got my mouse in the right place. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming in on this bill. 
My question is not so much about the bill itself because it sounds like it's a pretty important piece of legislation. Um, it's more about the process as related to the money um, since we're in appropriations. The fiscal note says we could have upwards of $570,000 for legal aid evaluations, representation, plus another 25,000 for the forensic work group, plus another 7,500 or so um, for the per diem. So we're talking over 600, possibly over $600,000. And I'm just wondering, I, I guess I'm surprised that this kind of money is coming to us so late in the session and wondering was there money actually ever appropriated in the Senate? I mean, what, what happened that this is ending up here now? So, so I can jump into that and Erica probably could, if I miss anything on this. Uh, again, my understanding is that uh, the uh, appropriation was in this bill initially. Uh, the uh, Senate Judiciary took it out. And, and I thought my understanding was that the intention was that they were going to put it into the budget that they sent back over for whatever reason that didn't happen. I don't know if it was an oversight or if they changed their mind. I just don't know uh, why that that follow-up didn't occur. Uh, maybe Eric has, uh, has okay. more insight on that. Uh, the only thing I would, I would add is that um, actually I think the appropriation was in the bill as it came out of Senate Judiciary. So that it got voted out of Senate Judiciary with the 500,000 in it. It didn't have, at the time that there was no, the work group I don't think had that $25,000 yet, uh, but the 500K was in it. And then when it reached the Senate floor was when um, it got pulled out for purposes of review in the Appropriations Committee. And then as Representative Vaughn indicated, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was, it got lost sight of or or people had other things going on. I don't really know, but for some reason it didn't it didn't get back into the big bill before it came over. I think that's the chronology. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You will recall that it is fairly standard practice for um, the Senate to pull money out of bills and to collect that those. Um, obligations and, and to take care of them in, in the budget. And I, so what we don't know is why it didn't appear there. Um, I was told that in the, the Department of Mental Health thought that it might have an ability to absorb some of these costs within its budget. Can you comment on that, Deputy Commissioner Fox? Um, I, I think our position really is that, you know, we would do our best uh, to do that. I don't have specific figures that, that tell me that we can absorb, you know, the, the, the total cost of uh, the increased legal fees uh, for our attorneys or if we need, need conflict counsel uh, and such like that. Um, I just know that we, we would make do with, with whatever we have. Mm -hmm. Um, it just could it, it could impact our ability uh, to respond, uh, but I don't have specific dollars to be able to say yes. We could absorb the the uh, the attorney you know increased cost for our attorney generals you know per se you know or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our original yeah. hope was to try and do that, uh, but we actually had conversations with uh, the AGO office, uh, and that's where the conversation of potential conflicts could arise uh, and that we might need conflict counsel. And that kind of changed that, that picture a little bit because uh, we had not envisioned that the potential conflict, uh, if the attorney general's office was actually prosecuting the case, that it could create a conflict for the attorney generals of DMH uh, to, to be going against that. That wasn't on our radar until we met with the AGO's office. And so that did have an impact on some of our thinking. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, we have been hearing about the potential costs of changing the system to accomplish these goals. I, I am curious about what are essentially avoided costs uh, that exist today. And this is where I'm going to start getting a little bit dangerous in my speculation. So we have um, a, 
an increasing number of people, I believe, who are coming through the justice system, who are being held for competency hearings. And, and at any point, if I'm just way off the facts, please interrupt me. But this, this is my recollection, is that there are increasing numbers of folks coming through the system um, who are being asked to stand for competency hearings and um, sometimes being detained while those he hearings are um, being scheduled. And you know, so there are costs there. And particularly if, if people are scrambling to find the right people to represent. Whereas if we had a more efficient system that had you know, people standing ready essentially to represent these folks, would, would that change some of these other costs within the system? Do y'all understand what I'm after? And am I just way off in my speculation? So we're seeing, hey, it could cost, and we're assuming the Senate's number was 500,000, but I'm wondering what the avoided costs are potentially. Um, I'm not, I would have to say I'm not aware of, of seeing uh, any kind of significant increase in the number of competency or sanity evaluations or requests for that, uh, even during the pandemic or kind of as we're slowly coming out of the pandemic. We've seen an increase uh, a little bit over the last month or two or three, uh, but we think that's also partly just a backlog um, because courts have been such slowed down during the pandemic. Uh, but it's been fairly consistent uh, numbers of competency and sanity evaluations for the last three, four, five years now. Uh, it's been pretty steady uh, numbers wise. We do have a backlog of forensic evaluations uh, that, that has slowed down the system, uh, but that's a, a separate issue from the lawyer issue. That's a, an issue with having a number of evaluators of which we have remedied at this point and have contracted with uh, numerous new providers uh, and we're, we're expecting to, to be able to uh, get back on top of and really be out of kind of the, the, the backlog of uh, evaluation cases uh, by mid to late summer. So, so okay. if I could thank you. So, I, thank you. Yeah, please, Lalonde. Yeah, La uh, so, I, I really, my understanding is the, the cost savings component really is just with respect to the Defender General, and I've already uh, addressed that part. Uh, the increased costs uh, mm -hmm. with regards to uh, the legal representation at DMH, you know, that, that doesn't have really, we're not offsetting other costs, we're just providing, I think, a better uh, commitment hearing by having their involvement there, and, and that's what that, that cost mm -hmm. is, so. Uh, but as far as uh, the holding of individuals in advance, uh, I don't think that this really changes that from what I understand. Thank you. I'm obviously conflating two things. Um, I, I have this recollection of the Department of Corrections talking about the number of detainees it is responsible for and um, some fair, I thought, so this is where I was dangerous, that some significant number of those folks were folks being held um, for some form of evaluations, and I was connecting this with that, um, but evidently I am wrong. Um, Representative Feltis? Yes, thank you. I <clears throat> I I guess I understand. <laughs> Representative Lalonde mentioned that by shifting this work from the Def Defender General to Vermont Legal Aid, that the Defender General can't reduce full FTEs because this is work that's kind of sprinkled around in various places. So I can understand that, but I would presume it would still nevertheless reduce some of the pressure on their workload so that uh, they would not be quite as pressured to be con looking for new staff. We always hear from the Defender General that they need additional staff or that they are tight and it's difficult to find staff. So I would presume even though they can't reduce the number of bodies, 
that they have on staff, it would allow them to perhaps just be more appropriately involved with, with all the cases they have and not necessarily needing to hire more staff as they are often looking for. And I, I'm wondering if Trevor has had any discussion with the Defender General about how this would impact their workload, this change. Yeah, I, 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 I thought about that, but I haven't had that conversation yet, and I will. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I, I, I am struck that um, th this is a particularly, it is a peculiar area of law and would require, I assume, a particular expertise and our defender generals are usually, I, I think of them as being generalists rather than specialists and that there must be a significant difference in the defense that one would receive being represented by an individual with expertise that can have all sorts of value in this. I'm, I'm seeing a head nod and I'm not seeing anybody saying, no, you're wrong on that one, Mary. Um, so I think we may, I, maybe I've got that one right. Um, committee, do you have, so I, what, what other questions do you have committee with regard to this co these costs um, or the bill? And, and, Feeling, I, Representative Iacovani. Thank you. Um, this position, DMH legal representation, ninety-five to one fifty-five. Would that? Would you? Do you imagine hiring a new person? Is that a? Is that a, It's a vacant position. It would be. Do we need to give you authorization for a new FTE? Um, I would have to check. I don't believe we envision uh, a, a new person. I think we don't want to quote me on this, but I believe we actually have uh, some folks who are not full time that we'd look to make full time, but also part of it is also to cover the cost of potential conflict counsel uh, uh, that we would have to hire in the case of uh, if the Attorney General's office is prosecuting a case. Uh, that we would not be able to have the Attorney General's office uh, uh, represent the department uh, as well. So you you imagine perhaps contracting out when you needed yes. those services? Yes. So it would go into personal services and some might be for existing staff and some might be for contractual and you would, you would uh, work that out. Can some of this um, uh, from a uh, clinical standpoint can this work um, be done remotely, determining my competence? It, it has been uh, pre-pandemic and has increased during the pandemic. Uh, okay. It's, it's, uh, there are national standards for doing the evaluations, uh, in particular with uh, remote evaluations. Uh, there, are so what about the, mm -hmm. might, there are certain pieces that might be better or enhanced in person. Uh, but psychological testing can be done uh, remotely, as well as the, the interviews and, and things of that sort. Um, I, I'm not, I'm out of my league here, and I don't want to sound like I'm trying to do this on the cheap, but I imagine, you know, um, could, could one of the public defenders be trained um, to be our go-to person to handle these kind of cases and do them uh, remotely, the, the uh, legal representation that's needed, or does that occur right in the court? And that may be more for Martin than for you, Maureen. But. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a slightly different question too. The evaluations by the evaluators happens remotely. Court is yes. happening more and more in court now. And I think uh, there might be some uh, specific circumstances where an individual may be remote into court. Uh, but not necessarily, you know, the attorneys as well uh, as the defendant, et cetera, all being remote. Yeah. Um, Rep 
Yacoboni, I know that um, Jack McCullough of Vermont Legal Aid is watching us and, and has, who, who it, and he, Jack heads the group that represents folks for in, in these proceedings. Um, if I, he offered to come in and I was thinking there's not time. And as you all know, we generally don't take testimony um, from non-state sorts of people, but if Jack is listening, and if Teresa will send him the link right away, um, I, I have a meeting at 2.15, but it just strikes me, we might as well hear from the person who is um, directly involved and can speak with some expertise as to how this process works. So I'm kind of hoping that through the magic here that in a moment we will see him- The magic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's all. Um, I was yeah. in a. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know. So, Teresa, did you hear me? Can you send Jack? Yeah. So, in a moment, I think maybe we will see. And rather than sending you off to have a conversation with him and asking, then asking you to come back and talk to us about it, I figured I would just short circuit this. Um, while we're waiting for him to join us, um, can I, 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 I'm sorry, I just, in, I, I'm trying to do too many things, so forgive me because I am sure you mentioned this, Rep. Lalonde. Why are we adding two more members to the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, other than my desire to be on that committee, and I'm not? Uh, I don't think the invitation's going to you, uh... Uh, Chair, <laughs> uh, and, and if it would help us get this thing passed, you maybe would think about it. But no, actually, it's because mental health has really become such a, a pressing issue in the justice, criminal justice system, and we really, you know, it's designating having an individual from the health care that deals with mental health. So that's that's why we are having somebody there. And I do want to flag before you turn to uh, Jack McCullough that there was just uh, the additional uh, issue uh, where uh, the stipends for the work, work group members uh, as far as addressing that. And, and I, I would ask that we perhaps uh, send a link to Ann Donahue to bring her in if there are any questions about that because that really was healthcare that dealt with that group. So if yeah. that's okay with you just to have her on, on uh, uh, the waiting to, you know. Okay, to, thank you. That that feels like we can sort that one out. That's kind of pro forma sort of okay. work. Um, and so it, I, I think Rep Yacovoni as the reporter for us of this bill can um, follow up on that. And okay. just uh, my suggestion that Mr. McCullough join us is that we, we're talking about his work and the work that his office does, and it felt like it might be a little more helpful to hear directly from him as to the benefits of this change in the system. And so, Mr. McCullough, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having watched and offered to do this. You've been hearing the questions we're asking and are trying to understand how this new system would work. So if you can, if you would like to just in a few minutes, we're really are running up on time, but if you could help us understand this better, that would be terrific. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for the record. I'm Jack McCullough. I am the director of the Mental Health Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid. We represent people in all the civil, involuntary civil mental health proceedings in the state of Vermont. This proposal comes out of uh, a legislative study committee that was done several years ago on studying the treatment of people uh, in, the, in the criminal system and in corrections uh, who have uh, psychiatric uh, conditions. And this was, has been proposed through a couple of biennium. Jack, you are freezing. Jack, you're freezing. I oh, or maybe it's me. Um, I beg your pardon. Maybe it's just my internet. So I thought you were freezing, and I was going to suggest turning off your video, but it's me. Sorry. Oh, it's quite all right. The uh, this 
it, for several years, it's been the idea that uh, the, the of pretty much all the players in the system that it would be beneficial for the mental health law project to handle these uh, hospitalization hearings because we not only have the expertise in the uh, in the body of law that's involved the uh, involuntary mental health system, but also we have the expertise of uh, all the components of the system and. Um, the, uh, the fiscal assumption that it's based on, in my project, we have four attorneys and uh, the fiscal note is based on an assumption of about 200 additional uh, cases per year going to uh, hospitalization hearings. And we are counting on uh, hiring two additional attorneys to do those hearings um, our assumption is that we would be probably litigating more hearings of this nature than are done in the uh, in the current system. That we would likely we'd probably go to hearing more than uh, are going to hearing now in the um, in the current system, where many of these cases are negotiated out and we suspect that we would be challenging hospitalization more than is done now, which would result in additional uh, hearing, which would be the need, would represent the need for the additional attorney time. Um, we, part of the, uh, all, the appropriation is in the neighborhood of 120 to 150 thousand dollars for independent psychiatric exams, it's uh, my observation from the cases that we see now coming out of the criminal system that although defendants in criminal cases have the right to an independent psychiatric exam, just like respondents in civil mental health cases, they ordinarily don't get those psychiatric exams. Both sides rely on the uh, findings of the forensic evaluation. And so again, we are expecting that there would be independent psychiatric exams being acquired that uh, are not happening now. And so that would involve uh, the additional expense at this point, since we're not doing that work, these are estimates of what it would be. And it's certainly possible that it could be either less or more than what we're anticipating now. Um, but we think this is a fair estimate so that we would not be, so that we'd be able to cover the work because my, my staff and I are already working full-time at all the cases we're doing now, and it would not be feasible for us to take on a large number of additional cases and absorb that work within the cases, within the uh, current staffing we have. Um, maybe I should just stop there and see if there are any questions. So thank you, Mr. McCullough. Um, we have uh, internet problems on the part of the chair, so I'm going to be taking over and I'm going to apologize now. I've got a budget phone call that is scheduled to occur three minutes ago. So, um, so uh, Rep. Jessup will take over if, if, you, see me, uh, uh, if you see me disappear. Um, it, so the, just to, just to uh, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm working several different issues all at the same time. Uh, so Vermont Legal Aid, low and high estimates are 245000 to 265000 a year. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Representative. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. McCullough? I think I see somebody reaching. So Maida, you're, you're, you're first, and I think we might have somebody else, but please, Maida, go ahead. Thank Hart. you very much. Thank you very much. I, I just don't want to be making an inaccurate assumption. These figures, are they one-time funding or ongoing funding? These would be uh, annual. 
ongoing in yes not yes. just a one time okay thank the you the plan is the plan is that we would increase our staffing and that would carry forward okay. thank you for clarifying you're welcome okay i think it's representative feltis had the, her hand up yes uh and then regarding, I assume that would be annual costs. And I assume, yes, if you need to add two more attorneys, then you have the, obviously the personnel costs involved. I guess my question is kind of internally for the group. How do we typically handle something like this? Would this be a grant to Vermont Legal Aid for a set amount of money annually that we would consider in the budget? Or would it more be a, um, you bill us by the case, something like that? Um, well, I, I can answer that. I guess I'm answering my own question. Yeah. Go ahead. In, uh, for the work that we do now, it's, it's, we're in the uh, AHS part of the, uh, part of the budget, and we have a contract to, uh, to do, the, uh, do the work that we're doing now. And I assume that that's how we would handle it for, uh, for this additional work. OK. And then there would periodically be a review to make sure that the amount of money that is appropriated for that purpose is sufficient or more than sufficient, less than sufficient, whatever. And we would figure out those expenses the next year around if there needed to be some adjustment. I believe we report uh, to the Department of Mental Health quarterly. Yeah, that's, could... Thank you. That's correct. Uh, the, the money... Uh, would come to the Department of Mental Health, and then through our contracts with the Vermont Legal Aid, uh, the money uh, go currently goes to them, and then these increased funds would as well. And we we review it quarterly to make sure that you know our the the budget line is balanced, uh, that we're not seeing overages or underage and and things of that sort. Okay, um, thank you. I've I I'm trying my internet again, we'll see if it works. Rep Jessup, be prepared to stand by if I get booted off. We have four people using the internet in the house today, so it's being challenged. Um, Rep Giacoboni? Yes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm back to, and I don't know who can best answer this, but imagine you're on the floor of the house and you have to report this bill. And um, uh, it very well may not be me, uh, uh, Representative Squirrel and I, Madam Chair, I don't want to cross over jurisdiction, but it, regardless, whoever it is, um, how would you answer the question, why are we doing this differently? Have we not been as aggressive with our representation previously as we should have been? How would anybody answer that? Because these, uh, you mentioned, Jack, uh, 200 cases. Um, and I'm, I don't think it's 200 more additional cases, if it is, correct me. But rather, the body of work could be 200 cases where it's believed more representation is needed. And I guess the, the question is, and, and I'm not trying to, um, portray anybody in a poor way, but is the belief from the state of Vermont that the people behind these cases need more aggressive representation? And if so, that's okay. I just need help understanding why we're doing this after all these years. Can somebody help me? I, 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 will, I will give you my, my two cents on that, Representative Yacobon, uh, yep. that... Uh, it's not that it's not that we're saying or that people are saying the defender general uh, uh, or de those defense attorneys are uh, not doing a good job or, or working hard for their defendants or anything of that sort. It's at, going back to what I said earlier. It's it's about ensuring that people have the most appropriate representation in court. I see this as a civil rights issue uh, that we're talking about a vulnerable population. We're talking about people who are traditionally underserved, uh, people who are uh, traditionally have very little voice uh, out there. And, 
And so I see this as a civil rights issue to, to ensure that their rights uh, are most appropriately defended uh, and that their defense is, is uh, uh, represented by, by folks who have the most knowledge and expertise in commitment law, uh, because we've now moved into an area of commitment and not criminal jurisdiction. Uh, and that is just not the expertise of uh, your, your public defenders. Uh, and so for me, from the department, and I think from many of the advocates uh, that I've heard testimony from, that we're talking about a civil rights issue uh, and ensuring that they have the most appropriate representation available to them. That helps. Thank you. Sorry it took me so long to get there, but I, I, it's a, it's a yeah. level of expertise. It needs uh, expert attention. Thank you. If, if I could add just uh, one real quick point on that is, you know, this is a different way that these individuals may be losing their liberty. I mean, it ties right into the civil rights issue that, that these folks may be losing their liberty, so they deserve to have the best representation we can ha uh, provide. Thanks. Thank you. Rep Feltis, did you have another follow-up? No. And any other questions for all of who are here? Okay, um, I'm not seeing any hands, so I will uh, circle back with, oh, I'm sorry, Jim, Rep Harrison. Yeah, thank you. Um, he doesn't really have a question though. <laughs> I just wanted some attention. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to just follow up on uh, Representative Iacovoni's, um question. Uh, and, and I appreciate Mr. Fox's response on the type of defense that may not have been available uh, up to now. Um, if you know if it's more of a specialty, but I'm curious, and this may be getting a little off track, but uh, it seems to me if you didn't have the right defense or adequate defense, there would be a basis for a an appeal and overturning of a decision made on behalf of the defendant. Has that been uh, the case in any of these uh, up to now? I'm not aware of any. Um, I'll, uh, I th would say that the majority of the cases that we're talking about, once there is a determination that the defendant is incompetent to stand trial or uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, and the overwhelming majority is the findings of incompetence to stand trial, then there is a resolution there's an agreement you know, to have the person be hospitalized or placed on an order of non-hospitalization. And it's my expectation that in some number of the, those cases, and it's hard to know until we start doing it, but in some number of those cases, once there's this determination of incompetency, there would be a contested hearing on whether the person would be hospitalized or placed on an order of non-hospitalization. And some of those defendants would be, um, would be successful at those hearings and not, uh, not subject to involuntary hospitalization or involuntary treatment. And so this actually gets back to a question that uh, the chair was raising about, is there a possibility of uh, of some avoided costs. And I think there is the possibility for some avoid, avoided costs, although it's impossible to quantify at this time. But if we successfully defend a hospitalization hearing and some a defendant is not committed to the hospital who otherwise might be, then whatever the state would be spending on keeping that person in the hospital against their will would be, would be a saving. Okay. Um, thank you. I just, it, it, you know, it, it would be much easier if we were just switching positions from 
defender general to legal aid. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, Representative Lalonde, do you have any further insight to my question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. I, I think uh, I'm looking at your question a little bit differently. It's really tough to show that there's been inadequate representation. Uh, but we can look at this as a spectrum that that defender general may be adequate and and uh, but but they're still uh, far away from the representation that they can be provided by the experts from Vermont Legal Aid. So it, it's kind of it, we believe that they deserve that because we're talking about their liberty rights. Uh, we wouldn't want Vermont Legal Aid to be representing them on the guilt or innocence at a criminal trial. You know they may even be adequate to do that, but they're not the right attorneys to be doing that. So, so that's how I'm looking at it. So yeah, Defender General, I doubt that they've been deemed to be, have provided inadequate counsel uh, so that a commitment is overturned, but it doesn't mean that uh, they're the best ones to, to be representing these individuals. Yeah. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. It's, it's probably a little bit of a um, subjective question and, and hard to um, you know, necessarily pin it down unless there were certain uh, cases. My last question is for Mr. Fox. Um, it, because this is now a significant amount of money at the end of the session that's not built into the budget that needs to be built into the budget every year, uh, is that something that the administration supports? My understanding that the administration does support uh, this this fiscal piece uh, going into the the this legislative session as well as uh, the last biennium. Uh, just so folks are aware, this bill S three uh, had a predecessor in the last biennium of S one eighty three, which was almost word for word the same, but never quite made it through the process. Uh, and the, the administration has been in support of both that as well as S3, knowing that there's a uh, fiscal note uh, attached to it. Part of what uh, hung S183 up in the last biennium was exactly this, fis this fiscal note uh, and, and the, the conversations around it. Uh, so it's our hope to get move that through this biennium, move this through this, this session um, uh, as we've retaken up this bill. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any additional questions? Okay, very good. Mr. McCullough, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Appreciate I'll, it. I'll log, I'll log off now if we're done. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So right now, as I, and I'm sorry, I've been, as I said, I've been multitasking and trying to, to do other things all budget related while we've been sitting here and, and listening with one ear. So right now, um, as I understand it, according to the fiscal note, which I have open in front of me, we have a request um, uh, for $460,000 on the low side, $570,000 on the high side. Nolan, I'm going to ask you to chime in here. Um, between 245 and 265, we would we would appropriate to Vermont Legal Aid, and the balance would be appropriated to Department of Mental Health. Um, 120 to 150 for evaluations, and 95 to 155 for legal presentation as necessary. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, and uh, if I may, um, in addition to that, you have there's uh, the bill appropriates 25,000. For section six for general fund to DMH and would need some additional money up to 7,500. But I, I, I estimate it'd be less than 7,500. Um, we'll say 5,000 just for argument's sake um, for per diems. So if you sort of use the, if you sort of round up or round down, if you look at the judiciary appropriate 500,000 initially in the Senate. Um, so you say 500,000, we'll say, is like a midpoint between the high and the low. 25K for the um, section six plus 5K for per diems, you would probably, you'd be looking at about 530, $530,000. Okay, is the, the funds for Vermont Legal Aid for the independent evaluations at DMH and DMH legal representation, are those all global commitment funds? None of them are. None of them are? Yeah. Straight general fund. Straight general fund. Okay. Representative Helm. Thank you, Nolan. Bob? 
I'm Bob. You have your hand up. Oops. I'm sorry. Um, you know, doing business at home. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but, I understand. Um, you know, I just, I, I'm just going to say this, then I'll shut myself off because it won't mean anything. But I, I, I'm sure we've had it, but I cannot recall very many times an ask this large, this late in the session, and. And I, I am at this point, and, and, and I think the idea is probably just great, but I, I, I think sometimes at this late in the session, all these littler ones and miscellaneous size get tumbled into us. And I don't ever know, and I'm sorry for that recorder, I don't ever know kind of like, what have we spent this week or month? Now we're adding uh, some six hundred thousand dollars onto it, and I, I, I am not talking poorly of the idea. I'm just talking about pure expenses here, which is, by the way, our job. Um, I, I just want to bring that up. It's it's a it's a gob of money, and folks, I'm telling you, in a couple of years, we're going to need money. We've got plenty right now, but it's not going to go on forever. So just thought I'd share that with you. Thank you. Bob, thank you. So do we have any further questions? I know one of the issues that I have, obviously there was no funds in this bill, so it's not like we can vote on the bill with, with the funding attached. We're going to need to do an amendment to actually insert the, the funds into the bill. Um, so we're going to need, and that's the reason why I would presume Mr. Fitzpatrick is here and that he could probably do the amendment. Is that an accurate, uh, question, Mr. Fitzpatrick, if he's still there, perhaps. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Representative Fagan. Absolutely. Uh, certainly happy to work on the amendment with Nolan or however, uh, however it helps the committee. That would be a good idea if perhaps the two of you could work together and come up with, uh, with an amendment that uh, that we could then act upon that would be uh, that would be helpful um it it uh, it needs to indicate um the uh, the the specificity uh of my question to nolan um the funds being allocated appropriated to to legal aid and then to the dmh for for two different uses and then uh, uh funds going to dm another twenty five thousand to dmh for uh for um the uh, to complete the work described and then an additional five thousand for the uh, the work group and i don't know who we're going to send that to but i'm gonna I, I hesitate to guess but if i had to take a guess i would say department of mental health so um, um uh, representative fagan I Please. I believe Eric could probably use this language similar to what was pulled out of the judiciary in terms of where it goes. All the money would be going to DMH because we don't appropriate money directly to legal aid. Legal aid. Okay. That's do right. it to DMH for their contracting. Okay. So I believe uh, Eric could probably just do the similar appropriation that was in the initial judi uh, Senate Judiciary with the addition of the $25,000 and the addition of, we'll say, uh, 5000 for per diems. Um, or yeah, something like that. Okay, I, I, I think that that's good. And then we could, uh, you know, we can um, um, take a look at that and consider that. So if you would please work with, uh, with Eric, uh, that would be great. And Maria, um, I have a question of you. What is our bottom line on, on general funds here? Because obviously we're about to, uh, uh, if we do this, we allocate an additional $530,000 roughly of ongoing general fund money into the future. Although I would imagine that the the the, the thirty thousand is not ongoing. The thirty thousand is one time. Is uh, is that uh, is that accurate, Nolan? The tw there's twenty five k would be for the group. Okay. Um, ongoing or one time? Yeah. One time. Uh, one time. Okay. okay. Yeah. The the study group and the per diems is also for the study group. And so that's a okay. one-time uh, okay. event. All right. So so we have thirty thousand in one time, and then not concerned there, and then or not as concerned, and then uh, five hundred thousand and ongoing. So Maria, could you ascertain for us the status of of ongoing funds to let us know where we are, such that when we when we contemplate the amendment, uh, we'll have that information, please. Okay. I um I need to talk to Steve and Stephanie about this 
because there's still a lot of different things moving around, but I will, I'll do that and I'll- okay, Very good. Let me know. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Very good, seeing none. I do, uh, I appreciate everyone's uh, assistance to this matter today. It is important and, uh, uh, you know, that we uh, that we act on this, so thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Representative Fagan. And, and I'll, I'll take this as a lesson that when uh, the Senate Judiciary takes money out of a bill, the, and we won't count on that showing up in the uh, budget that we see come over from the Senate. So in the future, we'll put it back in the actual bill so we don't run into this again. Thank you. Always helpful. You just never know what's going to happen in this building via Zoom or via actual. So just, uh, just pretty amazing. So thank you. Thank All right. You. Uh, so Teresa, if you will take us off live.